Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be here today with you because, as uh, Hans just mentioned, five or six years ago, I would not have imagined being with you today. Um, I am the mother to a child affected by San Filippo disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease, severely debilitating. And uh, my husband and I got the diagnosis of this child when she was only five months of age, which is an exception in the field because usually the disease is diagnosed much later around the Europe, the age of four or five years. As we at that time, we were confronted to a desert in terms of clinical development in this disease. We decided to tackle the problem by ourselves and started a program, which uh, I'm very proud to uh, introduce you with, which is a, an intracerebral gene therapy pro, uh, approach in the San Filippo type A. We have just started the clinical trial two months ago, and so this is what I would like to share with you today. So a few words of introduction about the company. Uh, is it me? The pointer, eh? OK, sorry. Right. Is it the uh, right button? Any other, uh, the right button is forward, yes. OK. So Lysogen is a biotechnology company engaged in the development of gene therapy medicinal products specifically designed for indications with severe CNS involvement. Its first program, SAF301, aims at treating San Filippo syndrome type A, otherwise known as mucopolysaccharidos type 3, a rare and fatal pediatric disease with heavy CNS involvement and with currently no cure. San Filippo syndrome belongs to a group of diseases that most of you well know of. These diseases are lysosomal storage diseases. And the important thing here is that this group of disease has given birth to has already given birth to new or new approaches in the field of therapies like ERT products that all of you know of, small molecules uh, approaches, <coughs> and which I hope uh, is a, or will be the next generation of product cell and gene therapy products. We think that gene therapy products have the potential, and this is what we'll uh, try to demonstrate, to uh, heal or to uh, address uh, maybe peripheral uh, effects or uh, parts of the, the disease, but which is the most important here, addresses the CNS. I think that because of my background, which is not neither in, in medicine nor in science, I may have um, worked in that field with a different approach, and uh, the result is that Lysogen um, managed to um, bring the product from the bench of the scientist to bed of the patient in less than five years, which I think is quite an achievement. So this is what I would like to share with you today. So first I'd like to describe what I think are the specific challenges of avant-garde therapy. We have already heard and listened to very, very uh, smart presentations in, uh, in that uh, in that field. Uh, the point is, I have my own views on that, and this is what I would like to, uh, to, to discuss or to, 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 to show you. <clears throat> Maybe what will surprise you is the fact that I think that the main challenge to start with is regula regulation. This is probably something that has uh, helped us a lot. Instead of thinking about science and clinic to start with, I started thinking about regulation because it's all about the framework, it's all about how the studies are designed. And I think that if we do not have an intimate perception of what regulation is and what it can become, so we may launch studies that will at the end be uh, either uh, insufficient or, or uh, useless. So in the field of gene therapy, we have complex, stringent, and evolving frameworks. We have a unique architecture where we have to abide by medicinal products for human use regulation, plus advanced therapies regulation, plus orphan regulation, plus pediatric regulation. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's something like a jigsaw, but with the difference that you don't know in advance, you cannot predict in advance the final picture because things are evolving. 
I'd like to give you a few examples of what makes things particularly difficult. So we have evolutionary frameworks, which to begin with means uh, we have different environments and you know that in the field of rare diseases, you cannot think, we cannot think within a national scope, you have to think worldwide. So basically you have to face different frameworks that are not convergent as anyone knows, but it's, it's, really, it's really difficult to, 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 to tackle. Second, sorry, within, why is it running by itself? I don't know. Okay. Within one single framework, again, you may have uh, also evolving uh, procedures, regulations, different sources of information that you have to, to pay attention to, even if they have sometimes different level in terms of hierarchy, but at the end you have to, you have to listen to or to, take, uh, to pay attention to uh, imbricated re re uh, recommendations or requirements from distinct origins. So you have the guidelines, you may go to the pre-submission and you will listen or you will be tell, told to, to proceed that way, but at the end when you go to the committee, you will be told that no, it was not the, the right manner to proceed. So it's very difficult to find your way and the path and procedures are very complex. And when I was uh, at the pediatric committee, there was a phrase that uh, the chairman used to, used to use, uh, Daniel Brasser, which, uh, which is uh, sponsors and uh, regulators are both on a learning curve, which is true for many, many uh, issues like preclinical studies design, quality issues where you will start a program with a certain idea of what you have to do in order to control your vector, for instance, but two years later, things have changed and you may have a different point of view, a different requirement. It's also true for viral security uh, um, demands or um, uh, expectations from the regulators or, to, uh, or a development of PIP and so on. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. We have scientific and clinical challenges in terms of study design. We work usually for young patients and due to, and I think it's a good thing, due to the pediatric, the existence of pediatric regulation, we have a burden, we have hurdles in terms of proving that our animal model or models is or are predictive. We have to perform juvenile studies, but it's not as simple as that because very simply, when you make tox studies with very, very young animals, you have to make sure that the animals will, will uh, support the fact that they are uh, in, a, in, a, in, in this process and they may die by themselves just because they are too young. So it's, it's a simple question, but it can block a study. Um, we also have to evidence or demonstrate that new routes of administration are safe. In our case, we are using intracranial injection. This is uh, not trivial. We also have to um, support the fact that we want to use such or such dose uh, in our uh, trial or in a study. Again, the issue is very difficult to handle because Obviously, there is a lack of historical background in terms of dosing uh, or vector dosing. We have to monitor immunological responses also in, in uh, relation to the dose. And if I, if I make a pause and think about how, how doses are, are determined, I'm sometimes a little bit surprised because with the same product that will be, uh, with, of which the titles could be measured in two different laboratories, you will have different measures. So at the end, what is the actual titer of your vector? And what is the actual titers of vectors that other teams are using if you want to compare with them? So you extrapolate your dose from what you've seen in your animal models, you extrapolate your dose, the one you want to use, by analogy with other teams, but at the end, what is the actual dose, doses we are talking about? It's not very easy to answer. We have, and we heard a lot about that, we have clinical challenges. 
we are working with small populations, <laughs> by definition, we have to, to um, enroll often extremely vulnerable patients, young, with multiple symptoms due to the diseases that are usually quite severe in the field of orphan diseases. We have the issue of treatment assessment. Again, we have the issue of statistical uh, limitations due to the size of the, uh, the populations. We have pharmacovigilance questions to solve. When you have a child with a severe disease with many, many, many symptoms, if you have an adverse event, or worse, a serious adverse event, how can you be sure that it is or not linked to your product or to the disease? So this is very, very specific to the diseases we are talking about. And then in the field of clinical challenges, uh, we have the issue of pediatric investigation plan. This plan, that, this plan that you have to define, to design in advance, and if the plan is good, if the plan is uh, validated by the pediatric committee, so it looks like an avenue towards market authorization, but it's a huge work to make a pediatric investigation plan in a disease where you don't have that, m that much background in terms of clinics, in a, in a field where you have all the other problems I mentioned previously in the field of science, you know, pure science. And, <clears throat> sorry, and in contrast to uh, other uh, products where you have data in adults, by definition, when you have a fatal disease, uh, a pediatric fatal disease, you don't have any uh, uh, adult data. So you have to start the pediatric plan. You have to think about your plan right from the beginning, I would say. And this is not very, very easy to, to, to do it somewhere blindly. You host, um, I don't know where. Hmm? <laughs> um, Another challenge is to find the partners you will want to work with. Obviously, Lysogen is a small company and has no and had no intention, uh, I should say, to develop and no no resources to develop an internal, uh, complete, full R&D department. So, we had to partner with uh, teams, either in academics or in the in the commercial sector for tox studies, which is not the most complicated. Uh, of course, working with uh, academy is very, very interesting and very powerful in terms of science, pure science again, but it's not that easy in terms of processes because we may be with people who think about publications where we think about regulatory files, so this is completely different. And the way a study will be designed for um, clinical development purposes uh, is quite different from the way a study would be made by, a, by an academic team uh, aiming at publishing a nice study. So it's a, it's a, it's a real challenge to um, have these people um, accepting not to work in a traditional manner because they are sometimes not used to that. Besides, besides due to the fact that I've seen quite rapidly that collaborative agreements where that are less expensive because there is a share in responsibilities, there is a share in IP rights and so on. Collaborative agreements uh, usually seem to me to be uh, factors of um, non-progression of certain projects because people will spend so much time discussing about IP rights that, well, times go, time goes by and the, project are not, the projects are not uh, progressing. So. I made the choice, and the teams accepted it, to work through research service agreements mainly. Uh, so, of course, I think I'm not the only one to use this kind of tool, of a legal tool, but uh, when, when I suggested to work that way with the teams we worked with, it was not a habit for them. It was uh, quite surprising. So uh, we had, to, we had to, to deal with this uh, cultural challenge. I'm sorry, I don't know. And the right one, Karen. And the right one. Eh? Yes, but I didn't touch anything, and the, the slide Let's went see. on. Let's see. Let me help you. It's very sensitive. It's very sensitive, I suppose. So? No, it was the one before. Yes. This one? 
Uh, no. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, back? I'm not used to uh, this. Back yeah. and back again. More yes. Back? This one? Thank you very much, Hans. Um, in terms of commercial interactions with uh, CRO that we uh, that we chose, that we selected for uh, our tox studies, we had to enforce uh, exotic, what I call exotic protocols. So it's not because we uh, selected very uh, experienced CRO that they were used to uh, making a stereotaxy in dogs and using a vector with GMO compliance issues and so on in uh, very young animals. So even if the CRO we worked with were very good, uh, it, it, uh, we, we still had to um, work with them to upgrade their skills and to have them comply with our demands. So it went well, but what I mean is that it takes time. It takes time and it takes um, input from, in that case, uh, uh, in, it means that we have to inject or to input new skills in the CRO. Um, we also had to uh, make huge studies sometimes just to validate one method of, of, of assessment or one method of measurement of what we had in our vectors. So for reproducibility uh, reason. But again, we are working with uh, medicinal products from uh, biological origins. So it's not that easy to reproduce, to reproduce the methods and so on. So again, we have to work with very smart CROs and very smart people within the CROs that are ready to challenge themselves and to put them at risk by, well, because sometimes they will find results that are just um, unusual or not, um, not expected. So they want, to, they want to understand and we want to understand. So it may take, take more time than what we think. <clears throat> we have GMP manufacturing issues. It's not easy to find a vector on this, uh, on this planet. <laughs> We don't have so many producers, <laughs> and um, again, because of the regulations that differ from one environment to another, you may have a very nice product manufactured in the U.S. according to the, Europe, the U.S. pharmacopoeia, but plus, 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 this is what we did. We had a contract with a U.S. organization to produce our vector. It was clear that the vector had to be produced according to the European pharmacopoeia, so we added m some testing to what the, the, the organization had, pre had originally planned. But at the end, it's still difficult to defend the dossier when, uh, when you're not on the territory where the product has been developed or produced. It's also difficult to find, uh, uh, so why is it so difficult to find, sorry, uh, someone able or company or organization able to produce the vector? Because there is the question of availability. For the sake of time, we wanted, we had our calendar, we had our timelines, and we didn't want to deviate from that. But when we go to a producer or manufacturer, of course, the producer has, the, had, has a planning, and it's not, we are not talking about producing, I don't know, yogurt or, or cookies. So mm -hmm. there, is, there are long plannings, and it's not so easy to find a slot. So this is one problem that uh, people developing gene therapy products have to face. There is, of course, the question of reliability, reproducibility, and scalability, as others mentioned. We have to contract. We have to contract. In the field, uh, it's, there has been different approaches. Some manufacturers would like to be um, service or product providers only, while others prefer to uh, endorse the responsibility of the sponsorship of a program, sometimes the, 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 the position of the organization is not as stable as what we would have liked, so this was difficult to find the, to find the producer and to contract and to make sure that things would be delivered uh, according to our, our timelines and so on, and we have to follow up, which is, uh, again, not trivial. Once you have your product and your dossier, your uh, quality, your uh, investigational medicinal product dossier, uh, detailing the, uh, the processes of production, of controls, and so on, 
you find that to the authority, but they will have many, many questions. So when you go back to the manufacturer, if you have additional questions, he, he, he's in a position to say, well, I have other things to do, so just wait a little bit. I cannot answer to this question, or, or this is a silly question that you have from the authorities. Just tell them that. Well, no, I will not go to the FSAPs and say, well, that's rubbish. Why do you ask this question? I cannot. Well, Eventually, we have the question of uh, clinical sites identification. Again, this is a challenge. The people, the, the, the physicians that, who are working with patients with rare diseases have not had until now so many opportunities to engage in two clinical trials because there are not so many clinical trials anyway. So in our case, we had to somehow disrupt routine uh, within the hospitals not because the people were uh, archaic, even though sometimes we met that, uh, but because there, is all, there are all these uh, notions of traceability, audit trails that these uh, doctors or physicians or clinicians are not cl completely uh, accustomed to and not very familiar with, and they don't like it. And uh, especially uh, when uh, the company is a small one, if, you, if your name is Genzyme or you know, whatever and you go, to make a clinical, to organize a clinical trial at the hospital, they know that we, the, the hospital knows that it will make much money with you, so everyone is like a soldier and everyone works well. But when we are a company of our size, very small, it's more difficult to, to uh, serrer la vis, as we say in French. <laughs> I don't know the, the equivalent in English. And we have, to, uh, we have to make some education, but um, educating uh, professors of, uh, in medicine is not that easy, especially when you're from uh, the patient field. Um, okay, so, and we have this logistics question because we are using a, a, a GMO product, we have to train team. In our case, we had to use and we are using, sorry, a new medical device, so the, 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 the people at the hospitals do not know how to use it, so we had to train them, and again, it took time, it took money, it took dedication, and it's, it's all about upgrading these people, but, well, that's not, that's not easy. And the last challenge uh, is working with p patient organizations. I think we heard a lot about it, and, well, obviously, that's one of my... Uh, uh, advantage because I'm the parent to patient and I'm, I come from the field of patient groups, if I may say so. But um, I just wanted to insist here on the fact that uh, the people who say, the, the pharma or biotech companies who say that they should work more with patient groups are just right because patient groups now are involved from regulation to the end of the product development. So you will find them everywhere, including in the committees of the European Medicine Agency. Uh, as I had the uh, honor to, to serve on the pediatric committee for a while. Business model. Again, you, you have a question? No, no. Oh, no, no, sorry. <laughs> One uh, minute. <laughs> again, um, we all know that there has been a long history of clinical development in the field of gene therapy, but there has not been any real commercial success yet. There are only two products approved worldwide, one in China and one in the Philippines, if, if, I, if I'm correct. We've had, unfortunately, recent failure in, in the field. Uh, and uh, even though some uh, key, and many, I would say, I should say, key opinion leaders I could make some quotations, think that the gene therapy field has the potential to become as successful as the market of antibodies. So again, future will tell, but there is a market. Concerning the market for CNS condition, it's still more interesting because of the fact that my pointer just don't help want you. to help me today. Okay. Yes, sorry. The current CNS market is large, as everyone knows. We have growing patient numbers, and we have all these diseases or conditions with high unmet medical needs and no cure. So, main technological hurdle for CNS drug development is, as everyone knows, the delivery to the drug of the drug to the brain. And gene therapy, for that reason, uh, appears to be a promising and safe approach due to the fact that it can express uh, sustainably 
protein in uh, exactly where the, 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 the need is. So I suggested also some quotation of, quotations of uh, people I've talked to. Uh, most important one, I think, is the fact that the promise, the one, the one I want to uh, pinpoint, the promise of gene therapy for neurological diseases is a once-in-a-lifetime therapy. It's something, I think. And the last thing I wanted to uh, stress in terms of business, uh, business model challenge is the pricing and reimbursement. And again, I will not... Um, detail the question of uh, background, uh, the background we are evolving in. We all know that there has been successful orphan drugs and that at the same time, or more precisely since a few years, we have heavy budget pressures and people who just don't want orphan drugs to be paid so much for. But my personal position is really to defend the idea that when we pay a medicinal product for a patient with an orphan disease, we are not paying only for this patient, we are paying for the whole community because there has, the patients with rare diseases are really the natural and sometimes the only candidates uh, to experiment advanced therapies. So. Without these diseases, I, I could say, uh, some therapies would not, not even be envisaged. So this is, this is something we have to work on. <laughs> oh. Do you have a nice mind? No, that's OK. Uh, yeah, well, you have it's 20 minutes. You have 20 minutes. And how many slides do you still have? I can go fast now. <laughs> can you give me another five minutes or not? Three minutes. Three okay. minutes. OK. OK. So, <laughs> Three minutes, so I, you can um, launch the video. They took two minutes, and then I will conclude. This is the, disease, the a patient. Arrête, Ornella. Ornella, arrête. Faut pas toucher. Non, 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 non. On met ça comme ça. On n'y touche pas. On n'y touche pas. So just in conclusion, um, the experience we've made until now at Lysogen is that we could uh, make a translational research in less than five years because of our methodology and probably because we really uh, started by uh, thinking about regulation and not the contrary. I really am convinced that we, this is the starting point and not something that we have to add at the end of a program or at the end of the reflection. And, um, just to finish, I would like to thank all the people who've been working on this project. It's more than 100, 100 people, more than 20 organizations, and um, at least five countries, I think. France, Australia, the US, the UK, and Italy. Thank you very much, and sorry for oh, no. having to be a